Let's talk about being human in a post-human world. And as usual, there's a story about this, an ancient story. This one from Aesop, who's writing, you know, kind of around the time of Homer, though we don't really know when Homer wrote it, but a um, long time ago, okay? When Zeus made man, he only gave him a short lifespan. The man, making use of his intelligence, made a house and lived in it when winter came on. Then one day it became fiercely cold. It poured with rain and the horse could no longer endure it. So he galloped up to the man's house and asked if he could take shelter with him. But the man said that he could only shelter there on one condition, and that was that the horse would give him a portion of the years of his life. And the horse gave him some willingly. It's going to sound like the giving tree, but this is way before that. A uh, short time later, the ox also appeared. He too could not bear the bad weather anymore. The man said the same thing to him about shelter. The ox gave him some of his life and was allowed to go in. Finally, the dog dying of cold also appeared, and upon surrendering part of the time he had left to live, he was given shelter. Thus it resulted that for that portion of time originally allotted to them by Zeus, men are pure and good. When they reach the years gained from the horse, they are glorious and proud. When they reach the years of the ox, they are willing to accept discipline. Really? I don't think that's right. But okay. When they reach the dog years, they become grumbling and irritable, and as a dog ear person, I can say that's exactly what right. <laughs> And my wife would say that. <laughs> All right. So remember that little story from Mexico as we discuss this very complex notion called posthumanism or transhumanism. And so what this is really about is what we've been talking about for the past uh, five weeks is our relationship to technology. And it's an interesting relationship, and I've taken great pains to point out that this relationship should not be seen as a binary. It should not be, technology should not be seen as something outside of us, because once you do that, you create a space for power to invade, and power will always fill that space. Uh, not that it doesn't invade anyway, but the binary is a special invitation to power. And so we also have this relationship to technology. And we've understood technology throughout this series in the ancient Greek sense of techne, as craft, as something, something being done in the world, uh, which is also pretty much what poetry is. Technology is something happening in the world uh, with human intention and motivation and at, by human hands. So Eric Hoffer, in The Ordeal of Change, writes this. The fantastic quality of human nature is partly the product of our unfinishedness. I love this. This is so right. Being without specialized organs, a human is, in a sense, a half animal. We have to finish ourselves by technology. Again, with this broader understanding of technology. You don't need to finish yourself with an iPhone. That's not what he means. And in so doing, a human being is a creator. In a sense, a half-god. <coughs> Again, lacking organic adaptations to a particular environment, we must adapt the environment to ourselves and recreate the world. The never-ending task of finishing ourselves, of transcending the limits of our physical being, is the powerhouse of our creativeness and the source of our unnaturalness. For it is in the process of finishing ourselves that we slough off the fixity and boundless submissiveness of nature. I can't think of a better two stories or quote, uh, story and quote to open a discussion of transhumanism and posthumanism. All right, so if we're gonna talk trans and post, we should know what the actual uh, word that's being modified is humanism. That's a perfect image for humanism. Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Following Protagoras, who uh, 
Um, though an ancient philosopher became the, the kind of icon of the Renaissance, where he said that man is the measure of all things. Humanity is the measure of all things. So humanism is credited with attributing the conscious, sorry, I'm quoting here from Diane Marie Keeling, uh, a book on postmodern posthumanism, sorry. Humanism is credited with attributing the conscious and intentional human subject, subject, self, as opposed to object, thing, as the dominant source of agency, most worthy of scholarly attention. Since its inception during the Renaissance, humanism has been constituted in various ways throughout history, but as the collective body of literature, the human is typically constituted through humanism as... See if any of this sounds familiar. Separate from nature. We are autonomous from nature, given intellectual faculties of the mind that control our body. Now, it's not as easy as it appears in a bullet, of course, we know that. But these are our aspirations. From Plato, who wanted us to somehow be free from the world of becoming and somehow live in the world of being, which couldn't be here, because everything here is always changing. We want to be autonomous from nature. We want to be, if not completely separate from it, we at least want to control it, right? Humanism. We are motivated by rhetoric and reason. Now, I know that's hard to hear in 2020, uh, but we still are. It's just bad rhetoric and bad reasoning that that moves us. Uh, you can look at you can look at any tweet. You can look at any Facebook post. You can look at any uh, political speech. I don't know if there'll be any of those tonight, but they all have the qualities of rhetoric and reason. Uh, Aristotle would say, "Yeah, I know what that is," and he'd break it down for us. That hasn't changed, and that is a central tenet of humanism: is that sure. We are affected by our passions, but we like not to be. We like to kind of get beyond those if we can. And here's a big one, superior to other life. That's embedded in our mythology. Um, I've referenced a few times the, the interesting book, Ishmael by Daniel Quinn. It came out in the 90s, I think, before some of you were born. Um, miraculously, I don't know how that's possible, but it's, um, it's the story of an ape who is looking for a student, teacher looking for student, I guess. And it's a fascinating discussion of mythology and humanity and how we make meaning out and uh, the various tools we use for that. Uh, one of my favorite parts is the teacher, the ape, is teaching the student and and he says, well, well, what's your story? What's your creation story? And he tells him a version of the Genesis story. But it doesn't matter what story it is because it always ends with humanity being this, the apex of creation. Right? And so the ape says, what do you think the jellyfish creation myth is? And the student said, I, I don't know. He said, well, don't you think it ends with jellyfish? <laughs> and that you're lower than the jellyfish. We are superior to other life. Um, okay, I, I don't want to spend all night on that, but that is huge. And when we go to the next series, which is on Native American wisdom uh, from various cultures, this will not be there. This assumption will not be there. And it's small, difference, but I think it's all the difference in the world. If you think you're superior, if you think you're, you are the highest form of life, so many things follow from that. And we'll see some of them tonight. All right, so what is transhumanism? Um, <clears throat> it actually comes from Julian Huxley, Aldous Huxley's brother who was a biologist and he wrote an essay called Transhumanism in 1957. Um, the idea here 
is to supplant evolution, to take over from evolution. Are we doing that? Of course we are. It's what freaks us out, is we're taking over from evolution. So, uh, again, this is 1957, and even then things were beginning to emerge that would appear that we had, we were now able to mess with the evolutionary paradigm, uh, the evolutionary process itself. We could affect it, right? Consciousness could affect nature, um, and the course of nature, more importantly, of course it can affect nature. Transhumanism is about human enhancement. Okay, well, we do that all the time. I've got this little thing that annoys the hell out of me. It says I need to stand up all the time. And it's not just something I look at, it taps me on the wrist. Right? And if somebody's trying to reach me, it taps me on the wrist and it says, you know, you really should stop and breathe for about two minutes. Okay, human enhancement. That's a small, easy example. You know many, many more. Um, for example, um, uh, there's something called the Paralympics, which happens after the Olympics, Olympics and it's Olympics for people with disabilities. And this creates a huge problem for, for the, the mythology of sport and measurement because these people who are amputees, especially double amputees, you've seen them, you know how they run, right? They've got these big blades and they're faster than non-disabled people. And you can see why, those blade things are awesome. Um, <laughs> And, and it's interesting too how uh, we have we have a few stories in our culture of this how you know a wheelchair is actually a much better ambulatory device in general than two spindly legs. Of course, it only if you make if you structure your society for a wheelchair, right? But on the whole, it's much easier to get around in a chair that has wheels, and yet we don't see it that way. Um, interesting how we treat human enhancements, but we keep doing it. The goal of transhumanism is eventual freedom from corporeality. Okay? Um, freedom from our bodies. That's an old notion that we'll get to in a minute. But these bodies, they kind of suck, you know? I mean, sometimes they're awesome. You know, when you're maybe 19. Um, sometimes, most of the time, though, they're, they're just kind of bags of water. And, you know, they're mostly ugly, most of us. And, um, all right, just me. I'll just, I forgot I was in Los Angeles. Excuse me. I'm the only ugly one here. Um, speaking of human enhancement, but let's not go there. Um, we want to transcend this body in more ways than one. You already know that there are plenty of mythologies and religions about that very thing. So what we're looking for, what transhumanists are looking for, is what Ray Kurzweil has called the singularity. I think this came up last time. Uh, it's a metaphor drawn from astrophysics, how appropriate. And it refers to the point <clears throat> of hyperdense material at the center of the black hole, which generates an intense gravitational pull. And so for transhumanists, the singularity is the point at which artificial intelligence surpasses human intelligence. Okay? We know about this. We can kind of see it coming. Um, Prophecies vary on how close that is. Uh, Silicon Valley and its corporate partners want you to think it's right around the corner. Ray Kurzweil, I believe, said in 2040, we would be downloading our consciousness or uploading. <laughs> it's an interesting choice. Uh, uploading our consciousness into a computer. And a lot of people go, chill out, dude. That's pretty far off. But the point is, we can imagine it. And it doesn't take a great stretch of the imagination to imagine the singularity. Um, 
So it's a convergence of human and machine consciousness. And we've explored this idea in our science fiction, our most relevant mythology, I think. Um, and the idea is that, for transhumanists at least, is that our consciousness will expand. It will be much faster. And not only that, we'll have greater human strength, emotional well-being, and overall health. Have you heard this promise before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet you have. Um, there's a guy, a biologist in England, who for years have been saying, we don't really have to die biologically. He's not talking about any technology. He's talking about reducing inflammation or eliminating inflammation. And he says, if we can eliminate inflammation in the body, which doesn't sound that hard to a literature professor, <laughs> um, then we would live forever. He says, my point is we've been imagining this, and our imagination becomes closer to reality all the time. Now there's another movement, and of course these two camps often argue with, argue with each other, called posthumanism. So this is Diane Marie Keeling again uh, from her piece on posthumanism. So this is, a, this is a different approach, different philosophy. It's, again, I don't want to get into the middle of these arguments. I just want to kind of show them to you. But posthumanism um, is really, and, and I think both of these are, really a perspective on change. How we recognize and adapt to change in the world. That, that's the 30,000 foot view of these two philosophies. Um, and once you get up that high, you don't see as many differences. I mean, this is analogous to Campbell's, Joseph Campbell's hopes for the image of the Earth um, taken by the Apollo astronauts, where there were no divisions seen, just the blue orb. Well, posthumanists think that we can get there um, with technology and with our understanding of technology. So, this is interesting. So, remember that human set of humanist tenets? I showed you a lot of those. Well, they come from Christianity. Some of them, they come from ancient Greece. But the idea of the subject, in particular, comes from a mathematician by the name of René Descartes, um, who Famously, it's actually pretty silly, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm a professor, I shouldn't say that, but his, his, method is, his method is good. He doubts everything. It's a scientific method. But then he, he goes from, let me stop. Let me start over. He says, given his method of doubt, I'm going to doubt everything. I'm going to doubt absolutely everything that I see. And why shouldn't I? Because he says, uh, at night, when I light a candle, the wax is hot and wet. And yet, in the morning, when the candle's out, it's just the opposite. It's cold and hot. Why should I trust my senses? Sometimes I dream, and the dreams involve sense data. Why should I trust them? So he doubts everything he can possibly doubt until he gets to one point, one thing that he absolutely cannot doubt. And the famous phrase is cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. The only thing I cannot doubt is that I'm sitting here doubting. That's pretty awesome. So when it gets weird, it's like he's being paid by the queen of uh, Sweden, and he can't leave that conclusion right there. Because, because what you have is a world full of minds and no bodies, and certainly no God. I think, therefore I am. So he's like, oh, okay. Well, this is awesome, but I better prove God in the world, <laughs> or I won't get paid. I'm sorry, I'm being a little cynical. But, and so he says, well, you know what? You know what? Among the things I think, there's this thing called God. Well, well, this God is greater than me, and so how could I have come up with that? Therefore, God exists. 
All right. And then, so now we have a mind thinking and we have God. We still don't have bodies or the world. Or <laughs> so then he says, um, we know among the things that I think about this God is that he is a good God and he wouldn't deceive me. And therefore the world exists. You see what I mean? It's a little cheap. It's like deus ex machina, quite literally. Anyway, whatever you think of his process, his, his conclusion and the effects that it had were tremendous and we still live with it. It's called the mind-body problem. And he actually attempted to solve this by claiming that the connection between the mind and the body was something called the pineal gland. So now he's, he's just flailing, philosophically flailing. But okay, and a lot of people talk about the pineal gland as some sort of special whatever. That's fine, that's not my point. My point is that that is the legacy he and his forebears left us is to think of ourselves as minds and not bodies. Well, posthumanism says, no, you're not even that. You're, you're a node in a network. Okay? Different metaphor, different reality. Um, the posthumanist perspective assumes that agency, the ability to act in the world, agency is distributed through dynamic forces of which the human participates but does not completely intend nor control. Does that sound like your life? It sounds like my life. Like I, I have this mind but it doesn't really do anything to the world. The world does things to me. I mean I'm, I'm part of it. Uh, my agency is distributed through these forces but wow there's a lot going on out there. So, post-humanist philosophy says that the human is physically, chemically, biologically, and every other way enmeshed, enmeshed, and dependent on our environment. Well, okay, now we're getting close to some Native American cultures and their understanding that, you know, in the West, we've got to go through our own path, you know, that's fine. Posthumanist philosophy says that the human being is physically, chemically, biologically, psychologically, philosophically enmeshed in and dependent on our environment, not nature, but the simulacrum, the stuff that we make. Technology, communication, nature, the world, sure, but we hardly ever reach that alone. We hardly, hardly ever have a direct experience of nature. I'm, I'm sorry, Emerson and all the romantics, but we, I don't know how we do that. Um, everything is enmeshed in language and communication and ideas and symbols and songs. All right. We are moved, according to posthumanism, we are moved to action by interactions. Okay, moved to actions through interactions, again, this sounds right to me, this sounds more like my life. It's not like I'm a mind thinking and I say, I shall do this, and I go out and do this, because when I go out and do this, I'm likely to get run over by some driver in LA, and, and where's my mind now, right? I am enmeshed in all this stuff, and it's illusory at best to think that I am a mind separate from or superior to all this stuff, right? Finally, for posthumanists, there is nothing uniquely human. Let me say that again, because it strikes at the very heart of our notions of ourselves. There is nothing uniquely human. Okay? Sure, we're a node, we're a particular configuration, say a particular constellation like in the sky, but that's because we've created that, those lines that connect those stars in that particular way. We're all just stars, you can connect them in any way you want. 
This is a quote from Healing. Possessing no attribute, humans possess no attribute that is uniquely human, but that is instead made up of a larger, a larger evolving ecosystem. There is little consensus in posthumanist scholarship about the degree to which a conscious human subject, our old Cartesian model, can actively create change, but the human does participate in change. You ever feel this? I want to do this in the world. I want Elizabeth Warren to be And so I, I go and, uh, I don't think she's even gonna win the New Hampshire primary. And so we constantly bump up against these things. And that's a, you know, a kind of political example, but we do it every day, every hour. I want this to happen. Why won't you do this for me or say this to me or make me feel this way? And it, it's hard. I mean, sometimes it happens, I guess. But this is a radical new philosophy where we are not the major agent, the major actor in the universe. We are affected by other actors, both human and non-human and everything in between. We participate in that change, but we do not cause it. Um, Again, for me, that sounds right. I don't cause that much. It doesn't feel like I cause that much. It feels like I react to things, but that means I'm not the agent. All right. So again, now this is really new. And I think this is really important because one of the things that technology does is it comes to us as a product, and we talked about this in some of our discussions. It comes to us wrapped in shiny titanium or whatever, and, and, and there are even people who do videos of unboxing technology. <laughs> and when the anthropologists from Mars come and study us, they're going to do, they're going to be, what was that about? Well, I think it's about that in part. It is, it is technology coming to you like a gift, right? And it's not just a device, it's what it promises, right? So if, if Silicon Valley or any marketer can make this seem like something new in the world, then we're always seduced by that. We're always seduced by the new. But I think it helps. If you zoom out enough to see that this has always been part of humanity, this sense of transhumanism, human enhancement, or posthumanism, our own inter, our own enmeshed reality within a larger reality. So, for example, human enhancement, favorite and probably most relevant story is Icarus who had a good father, Daedalus, who uh, gave him this technology of wings. And here's the story. My son, I caution you to keep the middle way, which technology never does, by the way. Uh, technology, we don't, with technology. For if your pinions dip too low in the waters, uh, too low, the waters may impede your flight. And if they soar too high, the sun may scorch them. Interesting how we tell that story, right? The danger is only with the sun in the way we tell it in popular culture. But th there's a double danger here, the water and the sun. Fly midway. Gaze not at the boundless sky, far Ursa Major and Budes next, nor on Orion with his flashing brand, but follow my safe guidance. And proud of his success, the foolish Icarus forsook his guide, and bold in vanity, bold in vanity, mm -hmm. began to soar, rising upon his wings to touch the skies. But as he neared the scorching sun, its heat softened <coughs> the fra fragrant wax that held his plumes, and heat increasing melted the soft wax. He waved his naked arms instead of wings with no more feathers to sustain his flight. And as he called upon his father's name, his voice was smothered in the dark blue sea. 
now called Ikeri, from the dead boy's name. The unlucky father, now not a father, called, Where are you, Icarus? And where are you? In what place shall I seek you, Icarus? He called again, and then he saw the wings of his dear Icarus floating on the waves. And he began to rail and curse his art, his techne. He found the body on an island shore now called Icaria, and at once prepared to bury the unfortunate remains. Creation mythology, we've discussed before, it's about becoming human. It's about also transcending what you have become. So Adam and Eve are created, they're in a garden, everything's cool. Everything's cool, they don't have to do anything. It's all fine. Except, in the midst of the garden, there's a tree that God commanded not to eat of, but it's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's the tree of knowledge. And we eat from that tree. We eat from it every time. Sure, we may debate about it a little bit, um, but we eat from it because we want the knowledge. And of course, the end of this, that story is God saying, behold, Man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. There's a popple vu that I've mentioned before, etc. There's Ovid's Metamorphoses, which is, I don't know, 500, 600 pages of human enhancement, human changes, right? We are seduced by this, and we have been for as long as we've been telling stories. The idea of human enhancement, of transhumanism, of post-humanism, of becoming something else. There's Eastern philosophy and religion, where we, we escape samsara and, and achieve moksha, and we are released into the one, into the one. <coughs> or in Buddhism, we, are, we experience nirvana, which means to extinguish. We, we Supplement, we enhance our humanity by eliminating our desire in Buddhism. And in later Taoism, I mentioned this last time, there's, uh, well, they become alchemists because Lao Tzu talked about the value of life, and so they eventually, after centuries, they began to take that quite literally and tried to extend their lives. Human enhancement, transcending our humanity. Heaven, I don't know if you grew up with Christianity as I did, but that's the promise of Christianity is to not be human anymore. To shuffle off this mortal coil to blend Shakespeare with the New Testament for a second. Um, to, to get rid of this, right? And there's a new heaven and a new earth and every tear shall be wiped away. And the implication is you'll have a new body. And, and every, all this stuff will be gone. We will have transcended our humanity. We will be in a post-human state. We've always wanted this. Gnosticism, for example, is a kind of neoplatonic, I don't know if it's neo, I think it's just platonic, uh, religion, philosophy, that essentially adopts Plato's notion of this world as being corrupt, and that the human being still has this divine spark. So we're actually gods trapped here in this world, and how do we ascend up through the I think it's seven heavens? How do we ascend out? How do we transcend our humanity and reconnect with our divinity? Well, that's religion and mythology. There's also our old friend Freud, who wanted us. I'm not sure what Freud wanted, so I'm not going to say that. But he showed us that there were deep, dark forces at work within us, and that if we could get in touch with those, if we could put those forces into a story, is basically what he's saying, then they might not have quite the effect upon us that they did. Carl Jung, of course. The collective unconscious, where there's a whole well of meaning 
that helps us individuate, to self-actualize, to, to transcend ourselves, to become more than the human beings we are. There's Joseph Campbell, of course, in The Hero's Journey, where the central element of the hero's journey is to die, to die. At the bottom of the circle, you must give up who you are. You must become transhuman or even posthuman, depending on the journey. We haven't talked about Paul Ricoeur a lot here, but uh, he was a um, really interesting French philosopher. He wrote about narrative a lot, but he also, in his later years, uh, wrote a book called One Self as Another. One Self as Another. Because we are at least two selves, and we are always losing ourselves, and that's what he said here, I find myself only by losing myself. Well, that's right out of the Gospels, too. And frankly, feminist theory and practice has taught us this here in the um, late 20th century, early 21st century, is always trying to teach us this, that these conceptions of the human are fraught, and we might want to look at them. We might want to see if they're gendered, for example. We might want to see how masculine our, our um, objective, absolute, not absolute, our objective, um, well, objective is a good word. Humanity is, when in fact it sure looks like a man, right? And what, are you, what might you be missing? in that conception of what a human is, right? So for example, the Renaissance didn't include women. It was man is the measure of all things. It was man. So feminist theory helps us get to this, one, this sort of wisdom. Now in the remaining time, I want to inflict upon you three philosophers of posthumanism. I don't recommend you read these books. Um, but let me see if I can share them with you so you don't have to. Uh, I say this because they're high theory, and if you're not into high theory, this is going to be very slow going, and you might even get angry. I've known people to throw these books across the room. Uh, I got a PhD in this because I'm a weirdo and I like pain. <laughs> so. This is going to go chronologically. Just three statements um, on transhumanism and posthumanism that I think you should know about, because this is the philosophy of the future of, of humanity, of being human in the digital age. So, Donna Haraway wrote a book in 1985 called The Cyborg Manifesto. How cool is that? Uh, the, a Cyborg Manifesto. And a cyborg, in case you don't know, is a, is a, a portmanteau word. It's a combination word, cybernetic and organism. Cybernetics, by the way, is the Greek comes from the Greek word Kubernetes, which means anybody know? Yeah, you, sh you shouldn't know. Um, it means a ship's captain. Interestingly, so a Kubernetes is a ship's captain. He's steering to the wide ocean, or the wine dark sea, as Homer would say. So cybernetics is steering the organism um, through technology, through cybernetics, through a, a technology of management or control, administrative technology for the organism. All right, so again, this is gonna get heavy, but let me see if I can get the essential points to you, because I think they're really important. And, and Haraway, in particular, not only set the bar for discussions of posthumanism, she also <coughs> put feminist theory to a work that no one had ever imagined. So let, let me let her voice come through here. She writes this, that a sideboard is a condensed image of a border war, right? the war between technology and humanity. It's a condensed image of a border war. She says this, by the late 20th century, 
our time, again, 1985, a mythic time. We are all chimeras, theorized and fabricated hybrids of machine and organism. In short, we are cyborgs. The cyborg is our ontology. That is, it's our way of being, the cyborg is. It gives us our politics. The cyborg is a condensed image of both imagination and material reality. Two joint centers structuring, structuring any possibility of historical transformation. In the traditions of Western science and politics, the tradition of racist, male-dominant capitalism, the tradition of progress, the tradition of the appropriation of nature, remember that, as a resource for the productions of culture, the traditions of reproduction of the self from the reflections of the other, right? Reproductions of I know who my, I am by who, by who you are because, especially, specifically because of who I am not. I am not like you. And, and that not carries, has carried the way racism and, and all kinds of things, misogyny, patriarchy, etc. So you define yourself by what is not, what you are not, and that not is never equal. It's never equal. It's always a subaltern. It's always an other, like she writes here. The relation between the organism and the machine has been a border war. Now, I don't know if you were here, God, that was years ago, September, when we did Gods and Monsters. I guess that was 2017. Oh, yeah, January 2017. 2017, we did a series called Gods and Monsters, and, and what we saw here is that hybridity is part of what makes a monster. To join two things, that's what makes a monster. And think. Think, for example, of Frankenstein, who is made of many parts. Right? He's, a, he's a hybrid. If you look at images of monsters, they're often hybrids. It makes it more terrifying. So the cyborg, or the monster, more broadly, is a perfect symbol for the border war between technology and humanity. She says the cyborg is a lived fiction. And it is. It's something that was a product of the imagination, Victor Frankenstein's, for example, or, or anyone's, that has become real. That has whatever real means. It, it, has, it means it can kill you, for one thing. That's real. Uh, she writes, the cyborg is a matter of fiction, a lived experience, that changes what counts as women's experience in the late 20th century. This is a struggle over life and death. But the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. I love that line. The boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. In other words, there is no boundary. Um, interestingly, and I didn't expect her to go here, but it's she's, she's an interesting writer. Um, she says that the cyborg is an argument for pleasure. So what does she mean by that? The, sta the stakes in the border war have been the territories of production, reproduction, and the imagination. Um, this is an argument for pleasure in confusion of boundaries and for responsibility in their construction. It's also an effort to contribute to social feminist culture and theory and postmodernism. You know what? Uh, let me just see if I can translate this. Um, Let's come at it another way. In the history of Western culture, in the history of um, the self, but even before that, the subject, sorry, not the self, the subject, going back to Plato, the inaugurator of Western culture, and Christianity, which fulfilled it in a certain way, fulfilled the philosophical uh, aspirations of Plato and others. Why the obsession? The absolute obsession with women's bodies. Why? Okay, and the, you know you can conjure many different responses to that, but uh, and they would include sexuality, but they would also include reproduction. Again, um, I've said this before. Forgive me for repeating, but I think it bears repeating that the Catholic Church in the 15th century had 
at its fingertips. Tremendous power, not just in terms of technology, but in terms of ideology. And where did it turn to exercise that power? To midwives. I mean, <coughs> there are heathens everywhere. You know, there are Moors, as they would call them, who had, had wounded the Catholic Church many times. But no, the real problem here is women and that they have babies. So for Haraway, this, the cyborg represents a way out of that, a way out of that trap where women are trapped in their bodies. Right? And we saw in our discussion on love and technology how birth control in general and the pill in particular liberated women like never before. Anyway, I don't want to go back to there. Uh, anyway, the cyborg is committed to irony, and I love that because it is itself ironic. Irony simply means double me, and you've got a machine and a human being. It's walking irony. Um, she says, she says that cyborgs are not reverent. Indeed, right? They, they have, you would have to program reverence, and then what would you program exactly? They do not remember the cosmos. They have no memories. They are wary of holism, but needy for connection. Isn't that us? Wary of holism. Leotard says, suspicion about meta-narrative, but nevertheless needy for connection. Incredulity. Incredulity, thank you, Mario. Not suspicion, incredulity. All right, she said, now this might be help, more helpful. She says there are cr three crucial boundary breakdowns. So, so again, the cyborg represents this fusion of difference, right? And, and a breakdown necessarily of the subject, which is cogito, I think, therefore I am. The world begins with my mom. Not with the cyborg. The cyborg is a symptom of a breakdown, three breakdowns in particular. The human-animal breakdown. She writes this, by the late 20th century in the United States scientific culture, the boundary between human and animal is thoroughly breached. The last beachheads of uniqueness have been polluted, if not turned into amusement parks. Language tool use, social behavior, mental events, nothing really convincingly settles the separation of human and animal. Movements for animal rights, and this is a feature that maybe you didn't see coming in transhumanism and posthumanism, animal rights. Um, movements for animal rights are not irrational denials of human uniqueness, they are clear sighted recognition of connection across the discredited breach of nature and culture. All right, there's the breakdown. We saw when we studied uh, the Human Genome Project that uh, this happened. We were expecting massive differences in uh, the genome between humans and apes, and there was very little difference. The second breakdown, organism machine. Organism machine, she writes this. Late 20th century machines have made thoroughly ambiguous the difference between natural and artificial, mind and body, self-developing and externally designed, and many other distinctions that, that used to apply to organisms and machines. Our machines are disturbingly lively, and we ourselves are frighteningly inert. Physical and non-physical. Um, pop physics, this is her again, pop physics books on the consequences of quantum theory and the indeterminacy principle are a kind of popular scientific equivalent to Harlequin romances. <laughs> As a marker of radical change in American white heterosexuality, they get it wrong, but they are on the right subject. Modern machines are quintessentially microelectronic devices. They are everywhere and they are invisible. Modern machinery is an irreverent, upstart God, mocking the Father's ubiquity and spirituality. All right. 
Another voice here is Ann Catherine Hales, who, whose book, How He Became Posthuman, is really more um, largely a literature analysis. She analyzes literature, which is fun for me, but uh, unless you know the text she's working with, um, she spends a lot of time on these texts. But basically, she talks about how information became disembodied, right? And that's, that's for me, that's right. Information becomes disembodied, right? Whereas in an oral culture, as we are in right at this moment, things physical are happening. My larynx, is it my larynx that's vibrating? Something in here is vibrating. We're the scientists when you need one. Something in your body your eardrum is vibrating. There is a bodily connection between us. But as soon as we write, it becomes outside of our body. It becomes an object. Information becomes disembodied. It's now more disembodied than ever. The cyborg, she said, is, is an artifact and an icon. Uh, let me see. Let me move through this. Yeah, okay. So for her, the posthuman, how we became posthuman, what does that mean? We became posthuman when we chose pattern over instantiation. Let me see what she says here. The posthuman view privileges the informational pattern over the material instantiation, so that embodiment in a biological substrate is seen as an accident of history rather than an inevitability of human life. We live with that every day. We, we react to patterns, informational patterns, rather than bodies. Consciousness is an epiphenomenon, which simply means it's after the phenomenon or on top of the phenomenon. Right? Consciousness is not necessary. It's almost like a bug, right? It, it's, or a mutation. Right? It's not necessary. Consciousness is not necessary. Let's see what she says. Uh, the post-human view considers consciousness regarded as the seed of human identity in the Western tradition as an epiphenomenon, as an evolutionary upstart trying to claim that it is the whole show, and in actuality it is only a minor sideshow, your consciousness. And then finally, sorry, not finally, uh, the post-human view thinks of the body as the original prosthesis. Hmm. that we all learn to manipulate so that extending or replacing the body, extending or replacing the body with other prostheses, remember the blades for the w, double amputee run, becomes a continuation of a process that began before we were born. And then finally, fourthly and most important, the post-human view configures human beings so that it can be seamlessly articulated with intelligent, intelligent machines. In the post-human, there are no essential differences or absolute demarcations between bodily existence and computer simulation. Cybernetic mechanism and biological organism, robot teleology and human goal. <coughs> Hale says this, and I, I think it's her best passage. If my nightmare is a culture inhabited by post-humans who regard their bodies as fashion accessories rather than the ground of being, my dream is a version of the post-human that embraces the possibilities of information technologies without being seduced by the fantasies of unlimited power and disembodied immortality that recognizes and celebrates finitude as a condition of the human being celebrates finitude, celebrates the fact that we die. And that understands human life is embedded in a material world of great complexity, one on which we depend for our continued survival. That's a beautiful statement uh, because she talks about the nightmare and the dream. But of course, what we've talked about for six weeks now is um, the fantasies of unlimited power and disembodied immortality. How do you short circuit that? That seems to come with the territory. All right, there's, a, there's another major statement on the post human by Carrie Wolf. 
And he gets involved with Jacques Derrida, the French post-structuralist thinker, and Nicholas Luhmann, who's, uh, who's a theorist of systems theory. And I'm not going to inflict this on you, because it's after eight, and you can read it on your own. But suffice it to say that it involves deconstruction. If you know what deconstruction is, well, actually, if you don't know what deconstruction is, it's basically taking apart the meaning of a text. And you can always do it. And it, because it's always embedded in a text. And if you want an easy and almost ideal example of that is, uh, what does the Bible say about X? Good luck with that. Because the Bible is the most self-deconstructing text I have ever seen. I mean, it's got 40 different authors. Uh, and spans like 1,500 years. And yet, we see it as this, some people see it as this complete whole. In fact, I grew up being told it was the inerrant word of God. This little Frankenstein of a text. <laughs> got away with that. <laughs> All right, uh, some of you may know Michel Foucault, a great French historian. And this is almost a, an afterthought in his book, The Order of Things, but I thought it was extremely relevant for our topic tonight. And I'm almost done. One thing in any case is certain. Man is neither the oldest nor the most constant problem that has been posed for human knowledge. It is not around him and his secrets that knowledge proud for, proud for so long in the darkness. As the archaeology of our thought easily shows, man is an invention of a recent date, and one perhaps nearing its end. If these arrangements were to disappear as they appeared, if some event of which we can at the moment do no more than simple the possibility without knowing either what its form will be or what it promises, were to cause them to crumble, as the ground of classical thought did at the end of the 18th century, then one can certainly wager that man would be erased like a face drawn in sand at the edge of the sea. Now, he's not talking about human genocide. He's talking about the genocide of a concept. This is analogous to Nietzsche's God is dead. So, Summarizing the series, um, here's what I would say. Human being being human in the digital age, technology is human. If we make that separation, we are done, because then the Terminators will come for us. I said it here first. <laughs> technology at the same time is other, just as oneself is an other. Right? It is something that is not like us, even though it is part of us, just as we have other selves that are not like us and yet are part of us. Technology, and this is borrowed and stolen from Marshall McLuhan, technology is an extension of the human senses. It is always, well, no, let me take that back. It's not always this. There's a whole other level. But mostly throughout our history, technology has been the extension of human senses, especially sight. Right? So, go home tonight and I can see everything that's happening here because I have extended eyes. That sounded creepier than I meant it to be, but you probably have cameras too and because it extends your sight. And most importantly, I think, technology restructures consciousness. It does. It changes our self-awareness. And uh, we can argue about that if you want. As I was thinking about this, this uh, line, this parable from Kafka came to mind, and I thought we'd close on this. Leopards break into the temple and drink all the sacrificial vessels dry. It keeps happening, and in the end it can be calculated in advance and is incorporated into the ritual. I think that's what we do with technology. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.